Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar provided by the Smart Group and National Electronics Week South Africa. My name is Bob Willis and I'll be organising the presentation and also presenting today's session. Before we start, I'd like to introduce you to the control panel that you have on your screen at this moment in time. It allows you to open and close the control panel, thus not obscuring your view of the slides during the presentation. You can click on the blue button that makes the image on your screen or on your projection facility go full screen, giving you the best view of the slides during the webinar presentation. If you have any questions uh, on the content of the webinar, any questions on points that I raise, then type them directly into the control panel, as indicated here by the red arrow. And we'll address the questions at the end of the webinar session this afternoon. Now, if you have any technical problems, please use one of the telephone numbers provided on your registration reminder emails. You'll also need your webinar ID number and access code. It's not possible for myself, the presenter, to assist you during a live presentation. At the end of the presentation, we have a couple of survey questions on the content, uh, the topics, and of course, what other topics you'd like to hear us present in the future. We'll be sending you a copy of the slides uh, presented during the session this afternoon. Now, this particular event is based around National Electronics Week South Africa, which is due to take place on the 2nd to the 3rd of March. And there are details provided on this slide, plus uh, the opportunity to register online. When you receive a copy of the slides, you'll be able to do that or visit the uh, National Electronics Week website. Now, Smart Group is directly involved in providing some seminars during uh, the, the event, and these seminars focus on a number of different aspects of technology, all relating to printed circuit board manufacture. And I show you the running order. So myself and Keith Bryant will be presenting presentations during uh, Thursday the 3rd of March. Uh, between the morning and the afternoon. And we also have one additional speaker on small component assembly. So if you'd like to participate, all you need to do is come to the seminar area, which will be positioned in the show. And these are all free to attend, and you'll be able to access copies of the presentation uh, after the event, as well as uh, the video recordings. So that's a little bit about what's going to be happening in the not too distant future. So let's move in to our topics of today. But before I do that, just a brief introduction about uh, the presenter, myself. I've been involved in mechanical engineering all my working life. I've been involved in uh, PCB assembly, PCB fabrication and manufacture, failure analysis. And basically, I've run a training and consultancy company for the last uh, 20 or so years involved in all of the aspects that I've been involved with in companies, as well as involved specifically in training, either online or hands-on within companies. So that's just a little bit about my background and my experience. So let's pick up on the subjects that we're going to be talking about. And I've picked uh, four or five different topics, uh, which are obviously important to most manufacturing engineers today. Components are getting smaller and smaller, as we know. And if we step back a few years, uh, the first introduction of the next generation of small components was the 0201. So 20 thousandths of an inch by 10 thousandths of an inch. And that took quite a while to actually come into fruition and actually be used. And then we got the next generation, which was the next size down, which was 10 thousandths of an inch by 5 thousandths of an inch. And from that point, um, we've then moved on to smaller steel components. Um, there are a lot of challenges with these components. They are more expensive. So you really have to justify whether it's necessary to utilize the components in your product. However, fundamentally, the processes used are pretty much the same. Now, in terms of equipment, um, if you're going to be using small uh, passive components, what do you actually need? Well, if you have what is generally uh, regarded as a, a state-of-the-art production line uh, with a high-end screen printer, pick-and-place and reflow oven, then you won't really have to invest. If you don't, then perhaps there is a necessity. So let's pick up on some of the areas. 
Well, first of all, automatic optical inspection uh, systems will handle uh, down to 01005 uh, components and solder joints, but the next generation are not covered by all systems in the marketplace. So if you are going to be considering AOI equipment in the near term, then think about the capability for smaller capacitive components and also QFN, LGA type components. Now in terms of stencil printing, generally speaking when we're talking about small passives, we're now talking about the use of type 4 solder paste and that's okay because the price of it is not significantly different than a type 3 product which has been standard in the industry for many years. We're certainly talking about the move to a fourth hour or 100 micron stencil for these types of components and ideally 3D inspection for solder paste either based on AOI or based on a 3D system within your own printer. In terms of placement systems, again it's the capability of using smaller tape as you'll see a little bit later on. The actual tape has gone down from 8mm to 4mm for the small passive components and it's probably not going to get any smaller than that because the tape is still much larger than the components as you'll see. Now in terms of reflow soldering, really uh, you ideally uh, need a reflow system which is capable, um, but for the passive components, really the only limiting factor perhaps um, is the use of nitrogen. Now in air reflow, some solder paste will not deal well and reflow to an acceptable standard small paste deposit. So if you've got a very small volume of paste, uh, a normal air convection system may cause graping of the solder paste powder, which we'll see a little bit later on. But for most applications, you don't need nitrogen. It's a benefit, but you don't necessarily need it. So make sure your paste is capable of reflowing in air for all size deposits. Now, just as a couple of examples of reflow, I have uh, included a couple of video clips just to show you some resistors and capacitors reflowing with lead-free solder uh, on the surface of the printed circuit board. These are 01005. Um, the problem about going down to the next components to show those reflowing is the camera system I have. It is limited to the size we can actually get down to, but we'll attempt to show you something a little bit later on. So in terms of if you print correctly, place correctly, then reflow really isn't a challenge from a thermal perspective. It's all about whether the solder paste is compatible with air reflow as opposed to the need of nitrogen reflow. If you're using vapor phase, um, then that won't be an issue. You don't get the graping effect where we've worn out the, the fluxing agent in the solder paste. Now, I mentioned that the component tape is getting smaller, um, going down from 8 to 4. And these are a couple of examples of 4 millimeter tape. Uh, component to so the top in paper tape for the 0201 but uh, moving to plastic tape for the 01005 and the next size down. And uh, just a close up view of some 0201 uh, components in the tape and its position of the component within its pocket. Now one of the issues uh, surrounding the use of tape with small packages uh, has been uh, ESD and static. So what you're looking at here on the left hand side is a video clip showing the components jumping out of the tape. Uh, during the feeding of the component prior to pickup. And the problem here is uh, static generated on the blister tape. Now, because we've moved to the plastic tape as opposed to paper tape, um, companies have been able to reduce the static generation, so consequently we're not lifting the components out of the packaging. So just be aware if you have a lot of misplacements Look very carefully, use a video camera to record um, the feeding mechanism and see whether static is an issue to you. This is not damage of the component, this is just preventing the component actually being picked effectively uh, from the tape due to static generation. Now just as a, a very simple demonstration, this is a simple Bob Willis demonstration. What you're looking at here is a video clip which shows me testing uh, 
uh, tape and I'm pe peeling off the cover tape and you can see by deflection of the meter reading uh, that we are generating a static charge so that's how we get the problem this is how we can see that we've got the problem and link the two things together now the next generation of components as I said um, going down below 01005 uh, I show you examples here and I show you um, uh, a couple of packages who have got a chip capacitor which has got terminations on the ends and all the way around the package on both ends and then on the second component the ROM uh, device on the right hand side we've just got terminations only on the bottom these particular packages uh, are using silicon technology to produce them as opposed to ceramic technology which uh, we use for resistors and capacitors you do tend to find that with the ceramic technology the tolerance on the terminations uh, is much smaller because of the manufacturing technique so this allows you to have very tight control of your design rules pad design rules for this type of component and you're only soldering to the underside so it takes up the minimum room on your PCB uh, during the assembly process just a, a close-up view of some of the silicon devices within the blister tape and viewing the blister tape from below now in terms of design rules um, I would suggest that you won't be running traces that's tracks between centers underneath chip components so you can use a, an open aperture so no solder mask between uh, the pads this aids the cleaning process if you're going to be cleaning it also reduces the possibility of solder beading that's uh, solder squeezing out from underneath the package but really that's related to poor design in the first place of the pad pattern again with this technology it allows you to use the smallest pad dimension on the board again and that may or may not be an advantage to you now you could, can use and we have used in our trials uh, resist defined pads and these are just examples of solder mask defined pads the issue here is the capability of your PCB manufacturer and why is there an interest again in resist defined pads is because it uh, gives more mechanical strength to the pad on the board as you decrease the pad size for smaller components the actual adhesion or strength on the laminate surface is reduced so if you increase the pad size but decrease the solderable area with a solder mask provided it can be imaged correctly then you're actually giving a better strength and this is used quite often with BGA technology uh, to reduce the incidence of uh, cracking of the substrate between the pad and the board what we refer to as pad cratering in the trade now a few issues with PCB fabrication um, it is inevitable when you get to such small pads and small dimensions that uh, we can actually have some problems with uh, shorts or uneven etching and what you're looking at here is just a couple of examples from one of our first batches of boards and we see we've seen this before on 01005 but we've also seen it uh, on the next generation down uh, also the accuracy and repeatability of pad sizes and their location on the board you tend to find when you're reflowing side one um, that when you flip the board over and look at side two the positional accuracy of the pads in relationship to the stencil is normally changed and this is the expansion and contraction of the PCB due to heating and cooling and it's a, a fairly well-known fact for ultra fine pitch assembly now one other thing is uh, etching and control of etching and plating processes here we have an uh, example of the printing process and if we print onto the surface of the pads then that's fine straightforward but if the pads when they're etched uh, we tend to have a larger foot area on the PCB and a smaller point you can see the problem or potential problem uh, where the pad is actually entering the stencil aperture um, it is not uncommon to do overprinting on small packages uh, because it's easier to print if you do resist defined pads uh, as I show on the bottom uh, drawing here you can see that uh, 
we're going to generally have a bigger printable area and it's probable that um, any over etching won't actually have an impact on the assembly process but again both options are open to you resist defined or copper defined pads a couple of examples of misalignment and in the early days of uh, trials on the new generation of components we had quite a bit of an issue with this and it's again the basic PCB is sort of beyond its capability if you like and we're doing a lot of things in printing and placement to overcome the general inaccuracies and when you're talking about printing onto virtually no pad at all um, a small error could obviously leave solder paste off of the pad but again by compensation and understanding the tolerances involved you can compensate for this we also uh, lost pads. Um, this is a good example where we've uh, been able to print, uh, uh, but there was no pad there. So one of the things is that as you go smaller and smaller pads, it's not uh, uh, entirely beyond reason uh, to actually wash the pad away, i.e. in the development process uh, during PCB fabrication. Again, we've seen this before during the introduction of 0201 and also where we've been sold leveling boards with no pad connection to a trace to hold it in place. Now in terms of printing, based on uh, the tests that we've done, we've been fairly successful in what we've done. Um, these are just some results just to give you an understanding uh, on 01005 pads. And this is with a 3000 stencil. We've actually gone down to 3000 as opposed to 4000 for this technology test. Um, however, you might need 4000 to allow you to compensate for other components on the printed circuit board. And again, when we've gone down to the next generation, we've got fairly good consistency on the print deposits, as you see for the 0201 in this particular case, uh, with the 4000 or 100 micron stencil. Uh, issues, well, we haven't really seen too much, many issues of lifting components. In fact, when I was doing the initial trials on 01005 some time back, uh, the only example of a lifted component, a tombstone, a Manhattan skyline, a draw bridging effect, uh, was this one here. And it was only when I was producing a, a training video to show it happening. So I didn't actually have it in production. But you can clearly see on these examples, we generally have got an excessive amount of solder paste. Um, so you can, as you go smaller and smaller, certainly reduce your stencil thickness, which is the, the better thing to do rather than reduce your stencil opening apertures on uh, your uh, uh, printer sheet. So again, it depends obviously on what type of technology you're soldering on the rest of the printed circuit board. Uh, micro sections, again, some examples of uh, solder joints formed. Uh, again, nothing really special. We've been able to solder them with vapor phase and convection perfectly uh, happily. Um, the problem sometimes is doing micro sections on very small parts. As you can see here, there's a little bit of cracking on the ceramic on the image on the left hand side. So that's not an assembly fault, that's a Bob Willis micro sectioning fault. But the important thing is the solder joints uh, have been produced su successfully. Now, on the most recent trials, just to give you a little bit more information uh, on the 03005 uh, parts, the smallest part you can currently get, um, I was using some Henkel paste, a deck printer, I was using 4000 uh, stencil, manual placement, yes, manual placement. Uh, it's surprising how many uh, pick and place machine manufacturers don't want to demonstrate small passive placement. Some can do, some say they can do. But uh, go to a pair of tweezers and although the throughput is not going to be very high, um, it's still going to work. And that's what I've done uh, on these parts. And we had convection with and without nitrogen just to see the effect on different pastes. So here's a, a couple of examples of not the best prints on these small pads, um, but it is quite a demanding process. Um, you can see a fairly reasonable deposit on the left hand side. Uh, we've got a pretty minimal deposit on the right. Um, again, you just got to work at this uh, with your paste manufacturer, stencil manufacturer and PCB manufacturer to get uh, the performance you need. In terms of placement, I'm fairly 
pleased that I was able to place uh, many of these components, although time consuming to do. And you're just looking at an example of a resistor uh, with uh, on the right hand side, and then you've got uh, a resistor, but a silicon resistor from Rome on the left hand side. And we use different pad sizes to try and narrow down what the best uh, design rules were for them. Again, soldering successfully and solder the part successfully. Um, the capacitor on the bottom right is perhaps a little twisted, but uh, the other two parts uh, I was quite happy with. Uh, you can see that they've got a fairly good standoff height um, with the parts. Um, we've got what we refer to as filletless terminations. The pads are just underneath the package. There's really no fillet on the solder joint to look at, um, but this is quite common on small mobile products. X-rays, again the X-rays show exactly the same thing, uh, good solder joints, virtually no termination overhang um, and in this particular case uh, no voids present at all. Now the one thing that you need to consider if you do get good printing uh, and achieve successful results there is the paste you're using. Most good quality paste from most suppliers today uh, can handle uh, convection reflow without nitrogen. Um, but these are examples of what you might see uh, with a convection process where the paste perhaps is a little exhausted. You've got to remember there is so little paste, so there's so little flux, so little protective coating over the particles that as you go through reflow, you're burning off and exhausting the activators in the flux. Hence, what happens is all the little balls stick together, but they don't actually reflow. So this is what is called graping. Um, by some companies, um, I call it wart, wart, warting, basically warts or spots on your face, um, but fundamentally it's all to do with uh, reflow compatibility. Nitrogen, vapor phase, works fine. Now just as an example of uh, rework, I've used standard rework techniques for um, the 0201 and 0105. So you can use flux, hot air pencil, controlling the airflow of course and a pair of tweezers. You can take them off, put them on again, it's not a problem. It's fairly easy to do. Of course under magnification uh, you won't be able to do it just with your uh, eyesight, I wouldn't have believed, I can't, so a microscope is necessary. Um, if you again want to do 0201 and 01005 you can uh, pick the parts uh, with heated tweezers I have not tried the smaller parts with heated tweezers, but I've used heated tweezers many times for the 0201 and 01005 packages. Now, when we're talking about the next generation down, um, a nice little technique that was uh, dreamed up by a couple of engineers uh, in the US working for Best and OK Industries. And I like this technique, and you know, whenever I see something new, I have to have a go. So. Basically, the replacement or even the prototyping, which I don't think you'd really want to do, um, with small passive parts can be done in this way. First of all, you put some flux onto the pad surface. We're talking about just a little bit of gel flux. We're not talking about liquid flux, we're talking about gel flux. Just a minute amount. And then we place the component into the gel flux, uh, as you see here. And then what we do is we place some solder balls. You actually buy solder spheres from the suppliers of BGA and other suppliers who supply solder paste spheres. The reason being to add solder paste of a consistent volume uh, to a small part like this or to use cord solder wire would just be impossible. You just put far too much on and make a real mess. But by doing this tech technique and then reflowing you've got a known volume of solder. Um, so this works very, very well. You could, if you're using solder leveled boards, which theoretically, theoretically, uh, should have sufficient solder volume on the pads to allow a solder joint to form. But if you haven't got uh, a, a tin uh, metallization on the component, this won't work. So if you've got gold terminations, it won't work because there won't be sufficient volume of, got, uh, of solder there to make it reliable joint. So this technique works quite well. So this is just a, a video clip uh, showing this particular technique uh, working uh, on a small uh, chip component. 
So we've put some gel flux on the pads. We've put a solder sphere on each end of the capacitor, and then we've just reflowed it uh, using uh, convection uh, with uh, a hot air pencil. Simple as that. And it works a treat. And I have to say, I've done it, so I know it works. You have to obviously speak to your different suppliers, uh, Cookson, Indium, who supply spheres, and I'm sure there are others like um, Almet um, and others uh, in uh, Japan. So again, that's a technique you might like to consider. It certainly does work. The next uh, topic uh, in our uh, program is press fit. Now, press fit may be an old technology to a lot of companies. It may be new to some companies. Uh, but press fit has been around for a long, long time. Um, we, as a company, when I was with GEC, took uh, some time to get into press fit technology because we were using wire wrap for all of our backplane assemblies. Um, we had an automated soldering process, automated wire wrap process. So the cost of the boards uh, was very expensive. And of course, at that time, you didn't have compliant pins. Basically, a, a non-compliant pin is a square peg in a round hole. So you have a small hole and you stick a square peg in it and it gives reliable connection. But you have to control the size of the hole. Uh, with compliant pins, they're more forgiving, which is generally all press fit connectors tend to be compliant pins today. So we take a connector of whatever type. Uh, we have a board design hold pattern based on the connector pin and we insert it and we get a, a good reliable interconnection. And you can do double side mounting of connectors as well, which is an advantage, which certainly wouldn't be feasible uh, with standard soldering technology, even if you used intrusive reflow. So how does press fit work? Well, just basic theory, first of all, you put a square peg in a round hole. You put a pin, pin in a hole which is larger uh, than the hole. And what will happen is the force that you apply will create a gas-tight joint within the plated through hole. So you'll get a low resistance connection. And because the pin is compliant, it should be able to compensate for variation in hole size to a certain extent. Uh, not, you know, it's not going to compensate for uh, large dimensional changes. But if you've got uh, using different uh, surface finishes, for instance, which could vary in thickness, um, it can certainly deal with that. So the two micro sections you can see are different styles of compliant pins. Um, and you can see the point at which they're making on the inner layer copper. So, so basically, we take our connector, we insert it into the plated through hole, and then we apply force with specialist tooling uh, to force it directly into the hole and make sure the connector is flush with the surface of the board. So what actually happens, and this is a computer generated uh, graphic, which basically shows how the force is being applied on the pin by virtue of it being forced into the printed circuit board. So obviously where the highest force is, theoretically, that's the lowest resistance path. Now, the important thing with connectors is to make sure that the pins are not damaged. This certainly wouldn't be acceptable. So quality control of the connectors that you receive from your supplier and also your own handling is important. If you inserted this with an automated process within the board, you would get a pin which is deflected underneath the connector and certainly would mean a scrap connector and possibly even a scrapped printed circuit board, which would be very expensive. Now, here's an example of a connector which has been positioned over the printed circuit board, the pins are in place, and then the head is going to come down and make contact with the connector body. Now, it is fair to say there are companies that uh, use very crude tooling and successfully get away with doing this type of assembly. But really, you have to make sure you're applying the force in the right position on the connector so you don't damage the connector or the PCB. Um, and you control the downstop to make sure you don't damage the printed circuit board. So again, 
it's a combination of the correct tooling uh, to make sure you get a successful result. So just as an illustration, this is an example of an assembled board and we're going to put a press fit connector in. Normally speaking, the connectors are put in last. So having an automated process or a semi-automated process to minimize the possibility of damage, I think is beneficial. The connector is positioned over the holes to make sure the alignment is correct and then it's forced into the printed circuit board. And the key thing here is not to flex the board in any way. The board must be completely supported so we don't damage any of the solder joints we've already produced. There also must be clearance on the opposite side of the board if you've got uh, connector pins which are longer, or th longer than the thickness of the printed circuit board. Now today generally most high-end companies or contract manufacturers will use automated processes and what you're looking at here is a press which is actually giving you a force measurement so it's actually giving you an indication of the force applied um, and what you can see on the left hand side graph is the initial force applied you can then see the force as the connector goes into the hole so you're getting a sliding action on the through hole metallization and then contact with the PCB so consequently it's slid into position um, you've got a deformation or you've changed the shape of the pin slightly against the whole wall and then you stop. So again, you can automate this process and it's good for traceability, particularly for uh, customers uh, who are subcontracting out uh, this type of assembly. You can use x-ray to inspect to make sure you haven't got any damaged pins. Um, you can use x-ray to inspect for slithers. This is tin slithers if you were using a tin plated board. Um, but just to give you an indication of the height of the board, uh, my wife is standing next to the board and this is about three and a half feet tall, the board. So you are limited to the number of x-ray machines that can take a board of this size. Now one of the other things that you might see uh, or come up against is back drilling. And this is an example of a multi-layer board, but some of the whole plating has either been removed uh, or uh, you fabricated the board to have this effect. Now normally they're back drilled, the reason being that if you decrease the uh, length of the hole and the length of the pin in certain regions of the board it can give advantages from electrical point of view for high frequency. Now I'm a mechanical engineer, I don't profess to fully understand it, uh, but I know the theory about uh, back drilling boards to allow us to have this. You can use back drilling of boards on thick boards if you want to for pin and paste reflow as well. Now just as I, uh, an example, I've just pulled up uh, some results and this was part of a study that somebody within the SMART group conducted on different board finishes. Um, now you can use press fit on pretty much any board finish um, and there will be subtle differences in perhaps the lubricative quality, the, the force being used to insert the connector into the printed circuit board. Originally we didn't used to use uh, nickel gold because of the hardness of the nickel, but because of the thickness of the nickel and gold today, uh, it is possible to use on press fit technology. Uh, tin uh, finishes, silver finishes are quite popular but quite often it depends on solderability of the board rather than compatibility with press fit technology. So there's just some, some results basically of um, force required and also uh, resistance values um, uh, as part of this uh, evaluation. If you want further information, if you look back through the Smart Group archives for Smarty Link, you'll find, find discussion on press fit finish evaluations. Um, just as a, a few examples of problems that I've seen over the years, um, I mentioned about nickel gold and this is an example of cracking of the nickel. I have to say in fact it didn't actually have an impact on the reliability of this board um, but it was something that we noted when we were evaluating uh, the assembly in an MPI build. Uh, but today because the nickel is much thinner uh, it shouldn't really be an issue and also you're using compliant pins. Using a tin finish on a board, um, this is an example of some tin slithers, but so these were actually tin lead slithers in this particular case, 
Um, so during the insertion process, you can see uh, how we've getting little like potential shorts. They weren't shorts, but uh, it's not an uh, example of good practice. And then, of course, we're seeing some tin whiskers, which, again, I personally believe that if the tin whiskers were only in the plated through hole, uh, it's not going to be an issue for uh, press fit technology. But I accept the fact it's an in indicative um, that the board finish is not ideal because it's generating tin whiskers, which it can do and has done, as you see in this example. On to our next subject that we were going to cover in this pre-show webinar for uh, National Electronics Week uh, South Africa um, is flex assembly. Now, again, I've always been fascinated by flexible technology, flexible circuits. Uh, we used to make them in our own PCB facility, and we did a lim limited assembly of them. Um, and when you've decided on the flexible circuit you want to use, the most important thing is defining the method of supporting or handling the flex. When you've done that, it is a lot easier to assemble. Uh, when you start looking at the assembly of flex, it's quite complicated. But when you simplify it by holding it rigid, then it makes life a lot easier. There are two basic types of flexible materials, but the majority of companies just use polyimide or Kapton which uh, has a very high temperature threshold. Normally speaking, most flexors are baked before use, uh, the reason being the moisture content. However, if you're using Kapton and you're using another form of uh, solder resist as opposed to a capping layer, so two layers of Kapton, uh, I kind of think that it's less of an issue. Certainly, I have less problems when I'm using traditional uh, solder mask over Kapton tape as opposed to Kapton tape and Kapton tape. Again, worth experimenting or referring to the IPC standards for storage and baking of printed circuit boards. Now, just I'll just show you this uh, slide just to explain the last materials I was working with. I was doing trials on two assemblies where we were using uh, these base materials, um, liquid solder mask, as I mentioned earlier and we were using different surface finishes. Um, there is a report available if you're interested on all of our assembly trials with different finishes. Uh, that's not actually covered in this particular webinar presentation, but it's available from the Smart Group office if you would like a copy. But first of all, just a couple of examples. Now, flex and flex rigid assembly uh, might look something like one or more of these examples that I show you here. And basically, it looks like a multi-panel, a matrix panel that we're familiar with today. But um, the flex is held rigid. And normally speaking, in uh, most of these examples, the assembly is actually done on a rigid board. There happens to be flex connecting one to the other, but it's not necessarily assembling onto flex. Uh, this final example, uh, although it looks as though you're assembling onto flex, you're not. Uh, where the components are mounted in the center area here, there's actually a piece of plastic. Um, so it's actually flex on plastic at both ends, where the connector is and also where the functional parts are. So again, if we're talking about true assembly just onto flex with no rigidizing as part of the assembly, uh, which would obviously add weight and cost then, we need some other method of support. So the examples here, again, very simple examples of assembly and connectors. But again, you've got rigidizing strips. And the top examples, again, you're assembling onto a rigid board, which is connected to flex, which is not the same. So what I like to do is play, obviously. Um, so these are just a, a couple of my dummy panels that I was using to experiment with uh, 0402 LGA, QFN packages, etc., and some passives and SOT 23s, etc. And uh, going back to 2005, uh, I was doing assembly trials using these, and I've used these boards as training boards and process uh, verification boards uh, ever since. Now, the key thing, and this is where the investment comes in, unfortunately, is holding the flexible. So what you've got here is I've outlined where the flexible sits on this pallet. Now, 
up until now I've just used one supplier's pallets because I've been very pleased with uh, the performance of these pallets for automated assembly and literally we've got uh, a pallet which supports the flexible and holds the flexible in tension to make sure that it doesn't flex or move during the assembly process so what you see here on the right hand side is one fixed location pin that's the one on the bottom where the flex is being held and then one floating pin on the top photograph on the right hand side which is actually holding the flex under tension so there's a spring in there holding it and the pallet is designed to obviously reduce the thermal effect of the pallet on reflow you can see it's recessed on the bottom directly below where we're reflowing and if we look uh, here we can see again the pallet and a close-up of the pins holding the flex in place so the pins have got a slight chamfer to them the flex is sitting down below the surface so the pins are just slightly above the surface of the flex for the assembly process um, but this works absolutely perfectly for the assembly screen printing soldering and any other process you want to put it through a couple of things to bear in mind when you're designing pallets always machine out the pallet to reduce the volume of material you don't want to reduce the uh, rigidity of it but you want to reduce the amount that it might have on your reflow profile you can reflow successfully on the solid pallet but it will just take longer um, and perhaps the profile won't be appropriate for all pastes and all components but by reducing the volume of the pallet you re eliminate this and also it's worthwhile putting holes small holes through it as well this just assists but also if you're using vapor phase reflow it allows uh, the fluid to drain away from under underneath the um, the flexible uh, or even if you're doing this in vacuum you'll still get some trappage so little holes underneath eliminate this particular problem with a, a pallet transfer now another technique you can use which has been used uh, by a number of companies over the years is sticky pallets and they are exactly what the name suggests they're a material which was developed in Japan uh, for processing flex uh, was available I don't know if it's still available from Senju um, but these pallets can be used you know in excess of 500 assembly cycles um, they can be cleaned um, the original users of these which were uh, Sony and Mitsubishi um, I've speaking to their engineers they've got a longer life than is quoted here I'm just quoting the material uh, vendors uh, life and they said they have been able to uh, to clean them and reuse them so again it's looking at the price but uh, they're certainly fairly easy to use and they just like sticking and you just peel it off and you've got no residue on the flex after the assembly operation alternatively if you're using flex in a, some other carrier medium then you might have to consider uh, using a, a cutting technique now this is basically the sequence of the sticky pallet assembly so you've got a fixture plate which helps you align the flex with the sticky plate and then you've got a separation unit which allows you to separate it from the unit as well so again it's worth considering looking at this and possibly investing in it there are other techniques uh, but uh, you know this is one of the alternatives so we've printed paste we've placed components so nothing really challenging when you can keep the flex flat and we've used uh, over uh, three or four uh, years uh, both convection reflow and vapor phase on these uh, sample boards with great success um, I've given you some process parameters that we used for lead free solder again they will be specific to your own board but they're examples and these are just basically some um, some pretty joints so what you can see here is uh, some uh, 0402s you've got uh, SOICs, SOT23s but also uh, we included um, LGIs on this particular test pattern and some x-rays and what I quite like um, is automated singulation of boards this video clip doesn't actually show flex in this particular case this is just showing laser 
uh, cutting out uh, boards from a panel. Um, it certainly is less stressful than breaking them out manually or using any other technique. Um, so, and it's become more popular certainly uh, in automotive companies to have some form of automated removal of the panel, the board from the panel. Okay, moving on to our uh, next subject, uh, QFN LGA packages. Now, this type of package has different names and different terms, and you'll see these ones quoted. Um, and the reason, it's part of the reason that IPC decided to use a common term for all of them, bottom terminated components, or BTCs. Um, because some of the terms used here, like the ML, FP, and the SON, and the MLP, are all trade name, really. They're names for the package. Most marketing departments like to come up with a name that you might remember that's associated with their name. I tend to use the term LGA QFN all the time because that's the generic term which is used. Now, IPC use the BTCs or bottom termination components, but you know what we're talking about. Now, in terms of information, there is a book which uh, called Chip Scale Package, which does cover um, these particular packages in terms of their functionality, not processing information. So it's their functionality, their test, their reliability, how the package are manufactured. The process information and design rules you'll find in 7093 from IPC. And it's uh, quite an exhaustive document. There's an update of this as well, uh, which might be useful to have in your own facility. Basically, these packages are a lump of plastic uh, with a bit of silicon, um, some lead frame, and wire bonding. And the main reason that these packages are growing in popularity is because they are cheap, bottom line. You don't have a lead protruding from the package. Uh, you're soldering to the termination on the bottom. Um, it, they're, they're manufactured like making um, blocks of um, chocolate, so little blocks of Cadbury's chocolate. You break a little block out. <laughs> In fundamental terms, it's similar. Um, but you're sawing these out of a sheet uh, or laser cutting them or jet cutting them out of a sheet after you've produced them and soldering them directly to the bottom terminations, as you see. You can get multi-row terminations as well, not just outside terminations. Uh, I've processed single row and double row. I haven't processed three row terminations, um, but again, the process uh, is fairly straightforward. Um, and of course, obviously the pitch is decreasing all the time and getting smaller and smaller. So this is an example of a two row package with a center uh, earth plane area or power pin or heat transfer area and the side termination of in the plastic. Another example of components, very similar with just terminations around the periphery. These are the most common that you see in manufacture today and a sideways view of terminations formed on the two types. Now you can also get ceramic packages uh, which have terminations only on the bottom as you see here and these are more like an array so basically like a, a ball grid array but without the balls. So the solder volume that you're putting down on the board uh, has to compensate for the lack of balls so you're soldering directly to the terminations. So again, these are a little bit more challenging because of the weight of the package uh, resting on the solder paste during reflow. So just to take a couple of examples, uh, a couple of design rules, first of all. Um, the basic design rule I use, I'll tell you where it comes from in a moment, but with any of these packages, I always like to have uh, a marker on them. Um, because I always like to have an overhang of the pad termination from the body of the part. This is to make manual placement and manual soldering of one pin. And I'm not talking about soldering individual pins here. I'm talking about the ability to rework one termination. So if you've got one open, you reflow one pin to make that connection sound again. Um, if you don't have any overhang of the termination outside the body of the device, you won't be able to get a soldering iron to it and have to rework the whole package, which is not a good idea. Also, if you want to do AOI, automatic optical inspection, you have to have something to look at. 
hence the overhang. The other thing I always like to have is uh, a chevron around the packages. You can see examples of two chevrons and one on either side. Again, it's alignment. It's very easy to align a package to a mark and also use it as a check mark or a mark reference when doing rework and replacement of parts. Otherwise, it's very difficult to do. This is simple and doesn't really cost you anything. Now, in terms of dimensions, I take normally a package and I'm old school. I like to measure things as opposed to believe what I'm told in the documentation from the supplier. So I measure it. So I've got eight thousandths of an inch wide on the pad, 15 thousandths of an inch on the length of the pad on the package. So basically, I'm going to come up with a design rule like this. I'm going for a couple of thousandths up on the dimension on the package to allow for etching. And I'm going to have an extension of 10 to 15 thousandths of an inch outside the body of the component. The reason being to allow me to do exactly what I said previously, inspection and rework individual terminations. Now, in terms of printing onto the design, a stencil would generally look like this. Uh, you always reduce the volume of solder you're putting on the center pad, uh, and you may reduce it further than this. Sort of, you're reducing it by 50 to 60 percent. Uh, the reason being, if you print the whole of that pad area in the center, the component will float, and you'll get open circuits on the periphery terminations. So this is good practice. The other reason we leave the um, uh, block apertures like this um, is to allow more of the volatile material to escape during reflow, thus reducing the amount of voiding that may be present underneath the package. But certainly you can go down from what I show you here, even smaller in terms of paste volume and still get a, a very successful product with good heat dissipation as well. Now just to give you an indication of what actually happens during the soldering operation, and just to show you um, the amount of volatile material. So this is uh, a LGI on the left-hand side reflowing, as you see. And then watch for the amount of volatile material which is coming out from underneath the package. And that is the solder paste volatile material coming out from the center area. So if you reduce the volume, you reduce that material and you reduce the possibility of float of the package and also uh, you've got less to clean out if you're going to clean underneath a package of this type. The second video clip on the right hand side basically is just showing you reflowing on one of my test boards and uh, the solder paste reflowing and forming the joint on the bottom of the termination. So. What I've tried to do in this uh, short introductory webinar to some of the presentation material that we'll be giving um, at the National Electronics Week South Africa on the 3rd of March, uh, so this is like a taster of the content. But what I'd like to do is give you the opportunity of answer, asking any questions. Now, as I said previously, if you've got any questions you would like to ask on any of the subjects I've mentioned, any of the points that I've raised, then just type your question directly into the control panel and I'll do my best to answer the questions for you. So I'm going to give you a couple of moments to consider a question and then uh, I'll answer the questions for you. I've got three questions that have come in so far from engineers this afternoon. So I'm just going to remain quiet for a few moments and then I'll pick up on the questions. Okay, first question, uh, how can I reduce the amount of voiding under LGA QFN packages? Well, the first thing to do is, as I've previously said, reduce the volume of solder paste on that center area. If you consider that uh, if you reduce the volume by half, you are going to reduce the amount of volatile material by half. If you use the uh, dimensioning up, so having a different pattern underneath the package, that will improve the performance. Another thing is to make sure you don't have open vias present directly underneath the package or you're not 
printing paste onto vias underneath the package and allow them to outgas. Those two things will significantly increase the amount of voids underneath the package. But that's the design. It's not the process engineer's fault, it's design. And you need to address that. If you're going to fill the, uh, the vias uh, with epoxy resin or, and plate over, you need to make sure those are not outgassing also. I worked in a facility um, a couple of months back and although the vias appeared to be totally closed, when you did a, a simulation of soldering, you could see quite clearly there was still outgassing. So those things are the things to concentrate on. You can do a certain amount by uh, messing around with the profile, but the things I've mentioned previously are far more significant. And if you get to a point where you've got, let's say, 15% voiding, uh, you're not really going to do much better unless you look at an alternative solder paste supplier. So I'm not suggesting you change your suppliers, um, but you know one product will perform in a certain way and you might get to the limit of that product. It's really design and other aspects outside of just the paste and the profile. Everybody blames those two first of all. Next question, uh, press fit. Are there any issues with solder level boards? Uh, solder level boards are not as popular as they used to be, it's fair to say. The most popular finish on PCBs generally in the industry uh, is nickel gold, as I'm sure you're aware. And concerns have always been shown about the variability of solder, of solder thickness on solder leveling. I have to say that with the improvements on solder leveling, uh, particularly on uh, lead-free with um, SM100C uh, materials, you know, the consistency has improved and provided the PCB manufacturer takes a little bit of time, a little bit of effort to make sure he processes your panels uh, at an appropriate setting for your product, not the same setting for everybody, everybody's product, you'll get good performance. And I've got solder level boards with 0201 on that I've been using for training courses for five or so years. Um, they still solder an absolute dream. So yes, it can be used. It's not the most popular finish, but for many applications, it works fine. Next question, do you use underfill on QFN LGA packages? Generally speaking, uh, no. I don't know of um, any companies that are really actively using the technology on these packages. Um, just to let you know that when you've soldered it to the printed circuit board, it is very difficult to break it off. Um, I do a lot of testing of BGAs for companies, what we refer to as die and pry. Um, and it's fairly easy with uh, BGA packages because you've got a standoff height, um, you've got solder ball height, so it's fairly easy to break off. When you look at flexing a board and trying to break off an LGA QFN package, because the joints are right around the edges, it is very difficult. Mechanically, it's difficult to shear it off. Uh, I've also used uh, a dry nitrogen uh, to freeze it to be able to break it off and still found problems. So um, I think that the likelihood of you breaking solder joints mechanically on these packages uh, is very low and consequently you wouldn't want to consider underfill. It's not really necessary, I would say. Do you have to clean under LGA QFN packages? No, you don't. Um, Again, it's just like anything, any process you're using, you qualify the flux material for rework, the flux material you're using in your solder paste, um, you qualify that as a no clean product, which will stand up to the environment you're going to use it in. So if you use the materials correctly, appropriately, then they should give you good reliability. If you use the wrong materials, don't worry about its uh, you know where it comes from etc um, then potentially there can be corrosive materials left underneath the packages and could give you some concerns but it's uncommon 
for me certainly to evaluate uh, QFN failures due to dendrite formation. I have done it, but uh, I don't find it that common a problem. Next question, what's been your experience with 0201 with vapor phase? Have you had a lot of lifting of components? No, in all honesty, I haven't. Um, you know, I've read like everybody else has you know, many articles on the subject, but I always like to do things myself to get a practical perspective on it. And we've assembled, you know, thousands of uh, 0201s. If you get the design rules right, um, they won't lift, even with vapor phase. If the design rule is wrong, then you may solder it very successfully with convection in air. If you then go to nitrogen, because you get a much faster wetting action, then you might get lifting. So uh, quite often you'll find that companies that never have a problem, when they've got a bad design, they have a problem. Or if they've got a bad design in air, and then they move it into nitrogen, they have a problem. So generally speaking, it's the size of the pads, volume of solder, which is the most significant things. Those are two most significant things that impact the lifting of components. And yes, reflowing in nitrogen or reflowing in uh, uh, vapor phase is a demanding process for a product that's not properly designed, hence the lifting of components. That's the last, that's, that's eight questions. That's the last of the questions uh, for the moment. I'm just going to give uh, a few more moments just to see if there's any more questions coming in from the delegates this afternoon. And just a reminder, as I said uh, previously, um, we'll be doing uh, a range of uh, seminar topics uh, during National Electronics Week in South Africa. Uh, myself and uh, Keith Bryant and Esther Galanti, I hope I've pronounced that right, we'll be talking about uh, small passive components. But all of these subjects will be presented uh, on the floor in the exhibition uh, on Thursday the 3rd of March and you'll be able to listen, get copies of the presentations uh, from uh, the Smart Group uh, seminar area. Well, that looks like it. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions come in. So what I'd like to do is thank you for attending this uh, pre-show webinar, and hopefully you'll attend the exhibition and uh, meet us, so meet some of us on the stand, and hopefully have lots more questions. So on behalf of Smart Group and National Electronics Week South Africa, good afternoon to you all.